Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. As you may recall, if you've been listening to recent episodes, we ran a Halloween poll to see which book we would cover for this year's Halloween special, and the patrons voted for Night of the Crabs by Guy and Smith, and Phil and I had a lot of fun reading it and talking about it. But one thing that occurred to us was there was something about Guy and Smith that we wanted to follow up on. And as it happens, friend of the show, Graham, a.k.a. at Open Sussex, a.k.a. at Kalu of Enmakar, a.k.a. Decadnids, check out his work on Bandcamp, has been going down something of a Guy and Smith rabbit hole in the last couple of years, and we've been having a lot of conversations about the works of Guy himself. Also, more recently, Tara, Guy's daughter, has established a presence on social media and started a Guy and Smith newsletter to celebrate the works of her father, who was, sadly, taken by COVID last year, almost a year ago to the time at which we're recording and releasing this podcast. So, we thought we would just dip our toes a little bit further into the Guy and Smith rabbit hole, pick up on another of the extensive series of Crabs novels in the form of Crabs Moon, and take just another look at the prolific author and his entertaining, if slightly dated, world of crab-based crustacean invasion horror. So, pack that pipe, get your swimming gear together. However, I would suggest avoiding the beach, and instead, come and join us in Derry and Tom's, as we talk about Guy and Smith and Crab's Moon. <coughs> This is Andy from the future, dropping in with a quick message. As opposed to Night of the Crabs, Crabs Moon does contain some references to sexual violence, and we do discuss them at the course of the podcast. So, I just wanted to let you know, and please, if you do have any sensitivities on that level, please proceed with caution, and look after yourself. Well, we're back in Derry and Tom's. And we're following up on our Halloween episode on Night of the Crabs. And for this extra special follow-up, Phil's returned, naturally. And we've also got our resident friend of the show and Guy and Smith Uber nerd. Is that correct? <laughs> Is that accurate, Graham? Are you uh, a Guy and Smith Uber nerd? I think there's... I probably am now. I think there's more nerdy people <laughs> <laughs> out there, but I, I'm becoming... My collection is becoming quite nerdy, I think. Yeah, and okay. every time you send me another picture of some of the <laughs> Guy and Smith in the wild that you've captured, I do get kind of jealous. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's official now. You are the Team Ruins resident Guy and yeah. Smith nerd. So yeah. let's just go with it. I, I think I've um, managed to persuade my friend to accept delivery of that computer if I choose to <sighs> buy it. <laughs> so yeah, maybe after Christmas. Let's mm. see. For the sake of the listeners, I think uh, we'd better explain what we're talking about. What is this treasure trove on eBay that you it's, keep on sending me? Well, it's uh, allegedly, we, we need to verify this, but from the mm. books, it seems to be true. It's uh, Guy and Smith's Amstrad word processor that he wrote some of his books on. And, mm. other, well, maybe some of his porn on, who knows? Yeah, <laughs> I, I would be disappointed <laughs> if he didn't. But it's got all sorts of other little funky bits as well, hasn't it? Like um, travel brochures and yeah, yeah, travel brochures. Uh, it's got some discs which might have who knows what's on there. Yeah, lots uh, of old three point five inch floppy discs. Yeah, yeah with so. uh, with lots of his writing on there. I'll tell you what, I'd be absolutely fascinated to know because, of course, we we know from reading that interview in the collected pulp volume. The, and I, I will name check that in the outro and put a link to that in the show notes. But that terrific interview with him, of course, he wrote things by hand. And we'll talk a little bit about Guy and Smith and his history yeah. uh, later on. But he wrote things by hand and then a mate of his from the Midland Bank <laughs> typed them up for him. But if by the point he's actually doing this uh, on his Mac, I wonder... Is not his Mac, his Amstrad. His Amstrad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I wonder if he, he ever kind of backed up any of his earlier stuff or whether it was lost to mm-hmm. time. Because another interesting thing that interview throws up is there was a sequel to Bamboo Gorillas. But we'll get to that when we get to that. I think we're, yeah. we're kind of getting a little bit excited. Yeah, yeah. But I think the most disappointing thing about that ad is that it says, bought it nine years ago, never <laughs> turned it on, untested. <laughs> It's a, it's, yeah, it's a risk. 
It is a risk, yeah. 200 quid's worth of old tobacco stained Amstrad <laughs> word processor that doesn't turn on would be a bit disappointing. Yeah, but there is the uh, the travel pamphlets. There is, yeah. What I would say is everybody don't check it out because I want Graham to buy it. <laughs> so, so please, ignore what we're talking about yeah. and do not check it out. <laughs> so but before we launch, I think we've got a mini agenda for this. We discovered after I picked up a couple more Guy and Smith novels, that Crab's Moon isn't a sequel. It's a sidequel, for want of a better expression. Yeah. And whilst on the, I think, second or third page, it says this is Night of the Crabs 2, actually it takes place at the same time, roughly, as Night of the Crabs. And does it fill in gaps? It fills in gaps that we didn't know were there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and kind of tell tells a side story, but we'll we'll take a look at that, and then we're going to talk about Guy and Smith kind of more generally. But before we crack off, crack off! <laughs> My God, what a terrible Freudian slip to kick off a podcast. Before we crack on, I think we need to uh, partake of a drink. And I know that Graham, you've you've lined yourself up a wee slate. What are yeah. you kicking off with? It's a uh, Abbey Dale. It's a new brewery. I've I've, I've, not, I've not heard of them before. Abbeydale Brewery, and it's a Lost Soul Imperial Chili Chocolate Stout. Now, mm. I'm I'm gluten intolerant, and this is gluten-free. So this is the first time I've found ah. a stout that's gluten-free. And it's 9.1%, which is a bit dangerous. Super. That sounds good. Um, none of mine are quite that strength at the moment. I did almost pull out my figgy pudding <laughs> Imperial Porter at 11%, but I thought, no, I'll save that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's Friday night. Let's, let's not go crazy. Um, so I am going to kick off with... A tooth and claw, one eye IPA. And I feel a little bit vanilla having an mm. IPA, to be honest, because we normally do crackers, potters. But it's uh, it's been in the fridge for quite a while, waiting its moment. It's a 7%er, and I think this might be from Aldi. Yep. I think this might be one, one of the ones you got me, Phil, from Aldi or Lidl. Probably Lidl. Yeah. What are you on, Phil? So tonight I'm on a 2016 Tempranillo called Backdoor Barrica. Mm. Oh. And I've just read the back and it's 14.5%. Ooh, that's a so good I'll, one. I'll sip it. That's a good one, yeah. yeah. Um, so Phil is single-handedly dragging up the standard of the uh, of the drinking <laughs> on this podcast. But interestingly, when you say it's 14.5%, we used to have a rule of thumb on red wine, didn't we? Where anything yeah. below 12% had a much higher chance of being horrible. And the higher it goes the more chance there is that it's actually a, a palatable red wine. And actually, as a rule of thumb, basic and barbarian though it is, actually worked out quite well for us, didn't it? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. Tasting notes. Assemble. Ah, that's... Um, oh. Uh, hmm. I was about to say that's that's quite agreeable and easy for a 7%er, but as is often the case with these IPAs, it kind of hits the back of the tongue like that weird combination of treacle and brake fluid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. special brew. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very much. How was your gluten-free it's, stout? It's good, strong, um, very spicy actually. It's quite mm. sort of chilly in there, so it's, there's a there's a real chilly kick to it. But I haven't had a I haven't had a stout for I don't know about four or five years, so it's mm. quite quite a treat to have something that's not just a standard boring. Gluten-free beer. Good stuff. Yeah. Phil, how's your tempranillo? It's very smooth and it's got nice vanilla notes. Oh, has it now? <laughs> okay. Well, we are all ready to roll, I think. We have uh, we have drink in hand. We have libations. Ah, exactly the same edition we've got. Yeah. Let me hold that up. So Graham <laughs> is holding up his copy of Crab's Moon and... We're on exactly the same one. Crab's Moon, the classic horror bestseller with a rather unfortunate geezer in a giant crab's claw. Unlucky fella. And this is the... Um, oh, it's not New English Library. What's the publisher of this? Sheridan Book Company. But okay, fine. Sheridan Book Company. And it's got a, a dedication to Mike Bradbury, whoever that may be. But anyway, so this says, just before chapter one, it says, in the summer of 1976, the giant crabs first attacked mankind on the Welsh coast. Part of that story was told in Night of the Crabs. The remainder is told in this book. Now, 
as to whether the remainder of a story <laughs> is actually told in this book, <laughs> I think is probably open to debate, particularly by the time you get to the end. But you know what? Let's take a look anyway. And for this exact purpose, I'm very pleased to say, and I'm going to share my screen, cool. that I have put together a PowerPoint slide which outlines the key characters in Crab's Moon. And uh, obviously for an audio medium like a podcast, <laughs> this isn't entirely appropriate, <laughs> but, but, but I'll share it. We could talk through it and, and, uh, and give yeah. the listeners an idea of what the fuck we're on about. And then I'll also probably put it on the, uh, on, on the blog or on the Patreon page anyway. Um, I'm really but, excited about it. Oh, don't, shit, don't get too excited. I'm, ve <laughs> I'm very excited about this. <laughs> well, disappointment awaits. <laughs> okay. Oh, look can at you that. see? Oh. oh, look at that. You have way too much time on your own. Yeah, I did this at work this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I love the colour the color coding. Brilliant. Yes. For, for, for the sake of the listeners, what we have here is a chart. And, of course, we have key scenarios from Night of the Crabs. We have Shell Island in the top left, and we have Barmouth in the top right. Mm -hmm. And then we have a selection of the key characters that populate Crab's Moon and how King Crab and his cohorts might interact with them. So what we find when we talk about Crab's Moon is that largely it's about sexually frustrated early to middle-aged men and women basically trying to shag each other. So we have Irie Wall, who's our, our first introduction is to Irie Wall. She's a holiday maker at the Blue Ocean Holiday Camp. She's a sexually frustrated fishing widow because her husband went on a fishing trip and sent Irie and her two kids to a holiday camp. So she's a bit fed up. Her first action is to tap off with another holiday maker who wants a shag called Keith Baxter, and they go to Shell Island, which, as we'll remember from Night of the Crabs, is where Cliff Davenport and Pat Benson get it on in the dunes. And Keith Baxter goes to the dunes with her, and, well, we'll find out. And then we have Gene Ruddington, who's a green coat at Blue Ocean Holiday Camp. Basically, she just wants shags. And then there's Gordon Smallwood, another green coat, who is technically Gene's boyfriend, but he also wants shags and has trysts or tries to have trysts with Irie. And then there's Jerry, the layabout hot dog seller, who's Jean's ex, an occasional shag. And then we've got other people, like we've got the Blue Ocean Holiday Camp manager, our owner, Miles Manning, who's like the wealthy American knobhead who has a yacht, who does his cowardly escape with all the money at the end. We have Barney and, oh dear, oh Graham, yeah. Oh, Phil, he is a wannabe sheriff whose appalling mother thinks that he's some kind of awful mistake. And then, of course, we have Cliff fucking Davenport, who, for whatever reason, pops up maybe twice over the course of this book, just to prove that there is a link to Night of the Crabs. But he's pretty much useless to everybody because yeah. he's too busy researching King Crab. And then we have a couple of other things on the chart. We have arrows connecting the crabs with where they intersect with, for example, donkeys, or where they intersect, for example, <laughs> with a bunch of lads who try to uh, escape the camp. But this is my chart of key characters in Crab's Moon. Any comments? I'm handling found... this like a work meeting. I'm going to say, <laughs> this, this, is my, this is my Crab's Moon process map. Are there any comments oh, from the yeah. team? I love the map. I love what you've done with it. You've missed off two characters that I think are important. The uh, oh, shit in Nora. <laughs> they, they're they're only incidental, but but they get killed obviously by crabs. Yeah, um, and that's the the two two friends that go to the holiday camp just to get shagged. Oh, of course. Yeah. Well, and and one of them has an unfortunate encounter with barbed wire. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to recall. Yeah. Um, I, I forget the names of the poor unfortunate <laughs> girls, but they tap off at the disco. And oh, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah. And that's and, and that's where the donkeys come in. The donkeys uh, come in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, b before we um, escalate this to the senior leadership team, we need to uh, <laughs> make these um, additions and make sure that those characters are added in, in on around the donkey 
Pat, the, the chat. Certainly around the donkey. If you yeah. can't remember their names for the life yeah. of me. Edna and Lucy. Edna and Lucy. <laughs> right. But also ban his parents because they were kind of middle class wannabes, wasn't yeah. they? That's right. So yeah, well spotted team. There are people yeah. missing from this chat, and I will update it to version 0.2 as soon as I get the opportunity. But Perfect. meanwhile, Crab's Moon. <laughs> now it's subtitled Night of the Crabs 2. But as we've said, it it isn't a sequel, it's a sidequel that adds a new dimension which is mostly sexual angst between lots of really really deeply unhappy people some rumpy pumpy punctuated by brutally violent crab attacks and clickety click clickety yeah. click 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 it's um but... x-rated hidey high <laughs> carry on camping yeah. isn't it <laughs> yeah it really is it's uh, all i could think when i was reading it was holiday on the buses <laughs> But it's yeah. also the moral of the story is if you have sex, you're going to get eaten. And if you have sex repeatedly and you don't mind getting fingered by soldiers in a truck, you will get run over by a crashing truck. That will be your punishment. And sexually assaulted. And sexually assaulted yeah. by a dirty hippie. Yeah. I have to say, I didn't see the being crushed by a truck coming until... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely nowhere. But, but 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 I've got to say, the last three chapters, it really does feel like Guy just thinks, you know what, I've done 240 pages. Let's wrap let's wrap this shit up as fast as possible. So anyway, I've got some uh, I've got some bullet pointed talking points. Okay. Oh, I've really gone to town. So it begins. We we were introduced to Irie, who is a sexually frustrated she's sexually frustrated because her husband prefers fishing. She meets a bloke called Keith. She goes to Shell Island with him for Nookie but he's a bit vain and decides that skinny dipping will make him all hot and glistening. But a giant crab pulls his knob off and he said... <laughs> you're, you're obsessed with that. Well, it's, it, 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 this, this is the book's opening gambit and you, you've got to respect that, haven't you? You've got to respect it. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't just eat him. It, it literally pulls his dick off. Is there a stronger opening gambit in any book you've ever read. It's a fucking pretty it's, it's high, there, high isn't bar, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, li I like the scene setting at the beginning. You know, the, the fact that there's a radio... Is it Radio 1 road mm. show or something? And That's <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All these people just turning up to... Because that's not mentioned in Neither Crabs, is it? No. Yeah. There is no mention of a holiday camp and there is no mention of the Radio 1 road no, show. No, no. So it's... Uh, but um, one thing... Uh, this side quill... That doesn't happen often, does it? I don't think I'm aware of a side call. I, I think there, there are probably examples of fictions where they're set at the same time, yeah, like elsewhere. But something that is literally set two miles away from the action points of, of Night of the Crabs, but none of the details around it are ever, ever mentioned in Night of the Crabs. I suppose from pers perspective of verisimilitude, you could say that Cliff Davenport is the last person who would ever know that there was a Radio 1 roadshow going on. Yeah. That seems fair. Yeah. But, yeah, it, it just... I mean, I'm guessing Guy got out of bed one morning and thought, what shall I write today? And this... Someone, a publisher said, can you do another Crabs novel? And I was like, well, I've done... I've done one about human sacrifice in Norfolk. I've done one about <laughs> Soviet experiments in... Scottish locks. I've done one about them invading Australia. So what can I do now? Ah, holiday camp, holiday on the buses, <laughs> struck hidey high, death trap, yeah, holiday yeah. camp. Fair play to him. It's audacious. Yeah, it's, and it's it's quite a big book, isn't it? It's bigger than Night of the well, Crabs. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Although, although I think I think there's, there's less words per page. Oh, maybe. Because the, these chapters did rattle by. Right. Once you got into them, so oh, that's why I could read it so easily. Yeah, that's why you need the Amstrad word processor, so you can compare word counts. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. she wakes up. She, she didn't realize he's been eaten by crabs. She just wakes up and is and is nowhere to be seen because he left his clothes behind and his car keys. She just thinks, well, fuck that guy, and hops in his car and drives back to the holiday camp. Can I stop you there? There's an important yes. link to uh, Night of the Crabs, which is the uh, beachcomber. 
That's right, Barnaby the Beachcomber. Mm. So we can instantly place it ahead of Barnaby's death. <laughs> I'd hope so. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's, we, we fairly quickly get a good indication of, of how this is placed chronologically, because chapter three is just a fucking reprint <laughs> of, of a chapter from Night of the Crabs. Oh, yeah. Even more audacious, yeah. he just literally reprints <laughs> the chapter where Ian and Julie die from Night of the Crabs. But yeah, to give credit, it does say, as related in Night of the Crabs. Yes, yeah, it actually does. So, as related in Night of the Crabs, which you may want to read if you want a better crab book. <laughs> you know, not uh, all I'm going to say, Crabs Moon does have its chams all its own. So, after that, we meet Miles Manning, owner of the Blue Ocean, the Ted Maplin of uh, of the piece, <laughs> but Ted Maplin with a yacht and cocktails, and he's got a, a party boat where he's having a some kind of premiere party, and they see the fireworks from the Shell Island invasion. You don't really know what's going on, but they hear gunfire, artillery, all his dancers are wondering what's going on, and we find that Miles is an American, kind of fancies himself, who's running a holiday camp on the west coast of Wales, <laughs> which is kind of wonderful. And he, he kind of plays a role which which is a little bit like the the mayor in Jaws, but also the he's like is a is a combination of all the greedy shop owners and the mayor in Jaws. Yeah. All the sea is an opportunity. But one of the most fascinating things about this chapter, which made me laugh out loud, was that Manning and his right-hand man, Winterbottom, go back to his office where there's a priority call waiting for him. Two green cuts say, there's a priority call waiting for you, Mr. Manning. And he gets in there. And who's the priority call come from? Piss artist <laughs> Colonel Good, who's managed to drag himself out of a whiskey bottle long enough to realise that one of his key duties is to tell Ted Maplin about a crustacean invasion. Absolutely incredible. Colonel Good finally comes good in a completely different book. Now, <laughs> what, what do you think Guy's motive was? Was was he trying to rehabilitate Colonel Good? It's a tricky one, isn't it? So yeah. he, it's, it's kind of didn't do much in Night of the Crabs apart from not believe anyone and get drunk. Yeah. So is this the only thing he's done is actually attempt to save the holiday camp? Yeah, and then we never hear Colonel Good's name again. <laughs> But but for whatever reason, he puts Colonel Good himself puts a priority call through to Miles Manning, aka Ted Maplin, to tell him about a crustacean invasion. So Manning now knows that that things are afoot. How does Manning respond? I wonder to the idea that his entire holiday camp and all his guests could be in complete peril. I'm going to read a little bit. A few minutes later, he replaced the receiver and turned towards Ricky Winterbottom and the two security men. That firing on Shell Island tonight, his voice was a hoarse whisper, his features white with strain and shock. The island has been attacked, virtually destroyed. There's nothing left of all the WD buildings and equipment, and there weren't known until daylight how many lives have been lost. Attacked, Winterbottom was incredulous. By whom? By hundreds of giant crabs as big as fucking cows. I didn't believe it at first, but now I do. It sounds crazy, but it's true. The Ministry reckons this coastline is crawling with them. That's what hit our boat out there tonight. We went right over the top of them, scraped our hull on their shells. Jesus Christ almighty. If they'd wanted, they could have overturned the Ocean Queen and done to us what they did to Shell. But they were too intent on tacking the shore to worry about us. So, Manning, at first, is quite rattled by the idea that there are giant crabs who could potentially have overturned his yacht, killed all his guests, and they've attacked Shell Island. What is Miles' next reaction to it, I wonder? Well, I think we're in a very fortunate position. Manning blew a cloud of smoke up to the ceiling and smiled. His confidence has returned. We've got good defences here because when this place was built, the seawall was strengthened and built right up to keep the high tide back. First thing in the morning, I want every casual labourer, from road sweepers and luggage boys to maintenance men down by the jetty sandbagging, Damn it, we can keep the bloody crabs out, no bother. And these folks in the camp will love it because they'll know they're safe. Our man in the street is a ghoul who loves to watch carnage from safety. And by God, he's right in the pound seats here. We'll make our name. Whilst everybody else is being wrecked, the Blue Ocean Holiday Camp will remain invincible. 
and through it all, the show must go on. We'll give them the time of their lives, and they'll come back here again and again, year after year. So, <laughs> Miles, Miles is really seeing the uh, the opportunities <laughs> in in West Wales, North West Wales, being invaded by giant crabs, and he's he's well up for it. Only because he thinks he's safe. He thinks he's safe, and um, I'm not sure that entirely positions him as uh, an easily identifiable protagonist. That's something else interesting about this book. Out of all these people we've talked about, who is the key protagonist? Just there. There isn't one, is there? Yeah. You've got yeah. Miles Manning, who's the you know, just the greedy businessman yeah. struck Jaws Mayor. And then you've just got a, a bunch of sexually repressed. Yeah, I guess the to me I, I was sort of following what's going on with Irie and who who's the other green coat? There's Gordon. Gordon, I suppose, is about as close as we get to there being a core protagonist yeah. in this novel. But even then, you can only probably say that because he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't do anything heroic. And, you know, we'll find out as we go along that he, 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 he survives abandoning the camp with a load of other blokes by the skin of his teeth by falling down a crevice <laughs> on a Welsh beach. Could he have done more for Barney? That's the other question. Exactly. Well, yeah. yes. Yeah. Poor Barney. Yeah. Poor Barney. Yeah. Poor Barney indeed. So nobody in this in this book is even vaguely heroic. Even Gordon, as we'll find, when he should be worrying about his girlfriend, all he's thinking about is <laughs> tapping up Irie. So it's it's uh it's it's another example of how kind of unusual this book yeah. is and, and what a strange departure it is from, from Night of the Crabs. And not having read a whole lot of Guy and Smith, i.e. I've read Night of the Crabs and Crabs Moon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not entirely sure if that's a pattern that repeats across it's, other Guy and well, Smith books. What do well, you think, Graham? Well, partially it does. But I think I think in this instance, I think it, it gives a real indication of just how rubbish most people are. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in general, you know, it gives that sort of indication of, you know, most people in a crisis would probably be Gordon. So actually, this is horror verite, <laughs> isn't it? Because yeah. also in Night of the Crabs, the soldiers are trying to fight the crabs, but it seems like these soldiers just want to have their way with Jean. Yeah, they want to finger Jean, don't they? I, I tried to be less coarse, but yeah. Yeah, yeah it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. We talked about bean flipping last time, didn't we? So it's, it's, you, it's, you, you it's, did. It's, it's yeah. too late to have any allusions to, you know, anyway. So all the workmen set to work on sandbagging the jetty. And then we find out a little bit about Iris' son, Rodney, and what a little shit he is. <laughs> because, because Rodney gets the most heroic, hardcore, tough guy, brilliant character in this book who only exists for three pages. Yeah. Rodney gets him killed, and it's outrageous. He's fucking about on the jetty wall and he gives this workman some lip and this workman threatens to tan his bastard backside <laughs> or, what, or whatever the expression is it's brilliant so he tick, sticks two v's up at this guy and this guy's not happy but he actually provides this guy with the chance to be probably the closest thing to a hero that this entire book has yeah but that's only because he's being a little shit yeah and the workman says now I'm going to belt your ass until you scream blue murder. And I'll belt your dad's too if he comes kicking up a fuss. <laughs> Which is fucking brilliant. <laughs> click, click. A noise like the hammers of a double barrel shotgun being cocked. Decisive. Deadly. The camp workman wheeled and then froze as his gaze rested on the source of the noise. Less than ten yards away stood a huge sand-coloured crab. It was at least four feet high. It's waving pincers like heavy-duty steel cutters. But the most awful feature of all was its face, almost human in its malevolence, tiny red eyes that saw and understood, its expression unmistakable. It was going to kill. Jesus God, the man paled, felt his legs weaken, his numbed brain already conceding defeat and death. To flee or to fight was futile. You just prayed that the end would be quick. Understanding amidst the fear that the reports were true, that the small force on Shell Island had died in a frenzy of terrible crustacean carnage. Clickety-click. The monster shambled forward in an ungainly sideways movement, slow and lumbering, but you knew you could not outdistance it. Rodney, still in the man's grasp, screamed once, 
a yell of terror that was beyond his comprehension, a child seeing the bogey which has haunted his dreams throughout the dark hours that he had never really believed in until now. That scream triggered off one single logical action inside the doomed man. His brain functioned once, but it was enough. <laughs> He's only a workman after all. You could, <laughs> could only deal with one thought at a time. His brain functioned once, but it was enough. He knew he could and had to save the child. Muscles bulged, and those ape-like arms shot upwards in a worthy Highland caber toss <laughs> that had Rodney Airborne spinning, flailing arms and legs, reaching his apex, then falling, landing on top of the sandbag wall with a sickening thud, lying there, winded and hurt, crying, not daring to look back down on the beach, trying to tell himself that neither crab nor man existed. The man closed his eyes, muttered thank God, and then he heard the crab clicking towards him, a sea monster beside itself with fury because some of its prey had escaped. An arm first, torn from the socket, Bloody sinew was trailing like scarlet twine, snapping, a lunge with the other pincer, a joust that tore the chest apart, gouging in the bloody wound, threshing, cutting, a giant mincing machine that crushed and splintered bone, tore the flesh into chunks and strips, then it bent over its carnage, began to feast in its own revolting way, masticating and slurping those awful features hidden beneath the scarlet slime. Oh, that poor guy. <laughs> that, that, that unnamed workman deserved better, I think. Yeah, he didn't. We don't even know who he was. You know, no. if, if this was a Sean Hudson thing, there'd have been a whole. <laughs> what's it called? What, what do they say? You know, there'd have been a whole description of his life, wouldn't there? Yeah, there'd have been a, a four-page vignette. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, same with James Herbert. Yeah, you know, would, would have found out all about his marriage. <laughs> would have found out about his um, seven-week-old baby. You know, would have found out probably what his favourite cigarettes were. Yeah. But in this, all, all we find out is that he gets very easily angry at children and he's got a quite simple brain. But when push comes to shove, when threatened with a giant crab, he will save a child. Yeah, toss him like a caber. Uh, toss him like a caber. <laughs> and, you know, fair play to the guy. I think that's, I think that's uh, admirable. But Rodney, I've got no sympathy for him. Sorry, Rodders. Do you think um, that name was picked deliberately? Well... The names of characters and the, the names of characters in Guy and Smith books, the two that I've read, are quite curiously mundane, aren't they? Because we meet Gordon and June in the next chapter. Yeah. Uh, Greencoats, who are convenient but unhappy partners. And we find out that Gordon's pretty unhappy and is with Jean because his wife ran off with her lover, Wilf Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she was widowed by a car accident, but his wife ran off with the sexual Tyrannosaurus that is <laughs> Wilf Robinson. Yeah. And th th there's, there's a bit later on when he's half fantasizing about Irie. And because of his wife running off with Wilf Robinson, he finds the idea of Irie shagging Keith Baxter in the dunes erotic. Yeah, that's a bit odd. Mm. They're, they're all quite damaged, these yeah. people, aren't they? That's quite quite deep psychological um, <laughs> stuff yeah. going on in this book, isn't it? If you, yeah. if you scratch the surface. There really is. And there's two things he puts a lot of effort into. One is the descriptions of crabs disemboweling people, <laughs> and the other is the internal monologue of characters whilst they're getting aroused by things <laughs> that they shouldn't be getting aroused by. <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. Can I just say, with regards to that, with because I do not like seafood, but I've seen, I, no, no, I don't. But I've seen, I've seen people eating crabs and lobster, and yeah. it feels like the crabs are doing the same with humans, like humans do with crabs. Yeah, yeah. yes, absolutely true. Slurping and, you know, yeah, slurping and masticating with slime on their faces. Yeah, there's always mm. a lot of slurping going on. Yeah, well, I mean, shit. If you've ever had um, something like langoustines in garlic butter. You know, we're talking pretty much the same thing, aren't we? Yeah. Doing your beard, yeah, you know, yeah. sucking stuff out of things. Yeah, I've I, I've observed that. Yeah, you have. <laughs> yeah, you, you've been unfortunate enough to have to observe <laughs> observe that. Yeah, is that I, why I, you don't? Is that why you don't like seafood? It's not the <laughs> it's not the taste. It's it's how it's uh, how it's eaten. <laughs> it's having to watch me struggle with it. 
But it's interesting how he goes down that line, isn't it? Hmm. Well, you know, the, 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 the crabs are pretty basic in their needs, aren't they? They want to disembowel people and they want to feast on the goo inside. I mean, you can't, you can't really argue with those motives, can you? There's probably, although King Crab gets the odd mention, there's less of King Crab kind of standing amongst them all like Napoleon and pointed in a certain direction. Isn't there indication in this that there might be two King Crabs? There is. Yeah. Is there? Yeah. Oh, that's I right. That. That's right. There's a couple of suggestions made in this. There's another one as, as well that I forgot off the top of my head. But yeah, there is a suggestion that perhaps there's more than one Alpha Crab. Is that because of the one actually inside the camp that's yeah. on the boat in Lake? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When the other crab is supposed to be out killing. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I did wonder how he got there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think probably even more than wondering how Cliff can, because there's at least one point where Cliff is on the blower to somebody, which time wise should pretty much align with when he's just found Pat Benson playing with herself <laughs> and spends spends 24 hours in the Victoria Hotel in Lambert. But more mm. even than that, King Crab is in too many places at once. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, we've, we've met Gordon and we've met June. Not June, Jean, isn't it? Jean. Jean. Yeah. And these, these green coats. And they are, I think, more than a little bit damaged, the pair of them. She's more so, I have to say. Yeah, so we we uh, we found out a little bit about how they met. Two nights after they met, he had invited her back to his flatlet for coffee. He meant just that, coffee and maybe a record, nothing else. <laughs> Somebody to talk to, a shoulder to cry on. It was her hand that had found his on the small settee, her lips that had gone in search of his, her tongue pushing into his mouth, a gradual arousement, and then her other hand had sought it out, a sensuous stroking through the thin material of his green coat trousers, and he was seduced. It's at this point you can totally believe as you're reading this that he used to write for Grot Mags. <laughs> because, because another thing we found out from that interview in The Collected Pulp is he actually wrote for Grot Mags in the 70s. Yeah. So she says, I haven't had a man for two years now, she'd murmured. Sometimes I get so that I can't stand it any longer. That had been the first lie. Okay, it was a means to a seduction an excuse for the near desperation which she'd shown once they were undressed. She'd gone to work on him avidly, her lips hungry for pulsing male flesh. <laughs> a crazy orgasm that had only been the beginning. She'd stayed the night, and from there onwards, she didn't use her own flatlet, except to keep a few belongings in. But she hadn't gone two years without a man. In the heat of successive orgasmic passion, she'd boasted of other affairs. Men who had satisfied her beyond her wildest dreams, but they'd only wanted her for a body. She needed more than that, she told him. She was like a drug to Gordon Smallwood, turning his previous bitterness into possessiveness. He couldn't bear her out of his sight, but he knew that to try and chain her would be to lose her, which is why he knew he had to let her go to Barmouth. Perhaps this sister of hers really was Holiday in there. There was no reason to suppose she didn't exist, except as a convenient alibi. That's pretty shrewd, Gordon, as it happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty shrewd. But it's absolutely brilliant that, like, you know, in, in the throes of passion, she's wildly telling him about all the other blokes <laughs> she's been shagging and how brilliant they were. And Gordon's up for this. Gordon's all over this like a rash. Yeah. There's, uh, I live near Bognor Regis, and oh. there's a but Butlins down the road, and this it, all of this just sounds so familiar <laughs> <laughs> to, to the goings-on that I hear yeah. as, a, as a youth of Butlins. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. In some ways, I kind of regret not being a yellow coat. <laughs> I went to work at Delapole Hospital as an 18-year-old, which, you know, probably, in some ways, wasn't that far different. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's not go down that road. Jean, they kind of portray as a sex addict. Yeah. I just feel she's really damaged. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. that comes out further on in the book, but yeah. Yeah. But I think also by part, partly how it's written, there is that indication that she's a broken person, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. She's she's super damaged. Yeah. Um, but Gordon's hunch is right. She goes to Barmouth to see her sister. Her sister. Um, I'm sorry for the sake of the listeners that had bunny ears <laughs> when I said sister. But she grabs a lift in, in a lorry of soldiers and lets them all cop a feel for for giving her a lift, and then uh, 
she goes to see her, her ex-fella, Jerry, for more Rumpy Pumpy. And we found out that, in our opinion, Jerry's a bit of a waster because he's only a hot dog seller and he's got no ambition. Isn't he a bit violent as well? Yes. And it just so happens that when she goes for a rumpy pumpy with her former partner, Jerry, the army are in Barmouth setting up for action, which you can only describe really as bad timing, Jean. Yeah, and she should have taken her bike. She indicated that she was going to cycle. She did. Yeah. She did. And I think we've already alluded to the fact that things don't really go that well for Jean from this point <laughs> onwards. She is now accelerating to a really ignominious, <laughs> ignominious end. Uh, but by gum, she has an adventure along the way. A horrendous adventure. So, uh, oh, I've, I've drunk my beer. So I'm moving on to beer number two. On this one, I am going for an LHG Cosmic Starry Dimension, which is a chocolate pecan and Tonka stout. Ooh. At a, a, 7%. A, was it a Tonka? A Tonka stout. Tonka um, toys. Tonka toys, yeah. yeah. So it's... Uh, Cacao nibs, pecan, tonka, oh, tonka beans, apparently. Oh. oh. Unless they just left a comma out and it's tonka, comma, beans. But no, I think it's tonka beans and oh. lactose. Oh, unusual. Hmm. Yeah, it, you can taste the pecan. Can you taste the tonka? I ain't got a fucking clue. <laughs> I can't taste chocolate, but I can taste coffee. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like a boozy cold brew coffee with a touch of pecan to it. It's actually very pleasant. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's so much like a, a cold brew coffee. You could even use that to make an espresso martini, I reckon. Oh, that sounds dangerous. Mmm. Now there's there's a there's an idea. Make an espresso martini, but use chocolate pecan and tonka stout instead of cold brew coffee. Oh. Mm. So shall I tell you about tonka beans flavour? Yeah. Tonka beans are best known for their extraordinary sweet aroma, somewhat similar to vanilla, honey, and almonds. However, tonka beans do have low notes of spices and tobacco, the reason for their welcoming warmth. Mm. Oh. I, I really like it. That's one of the nicest stouts I've had in quite some time. Nice label, too. Are you still on your uh, chocolate chilli? Yeah, I've nearly finished, actually. I'm going to crack open. It's the same brewery, but it's a 100-minute D-I-P-A, called Deliverance. Oh, 8.5. Mm. Good for the dangerous beers, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> it's vegan and gluten-free. Mm. There is a lot more gluten-free beers now, aren't there? Yeah, tastes like an IPA. Yeah. Anyway, so there's a crab in the boating lake. What are they going to do? And at this point, while there's a crab in the boating lake, Cliff Davenport visits Miles Manning. It's only Cliff Davenport. So this is before the attack on Barmouth, and this is why I'm not buying it. Yeah. I'm not buying <laughs> That while him and Pat Benson are getting dirty, that he just suddenly decides to take a trip to the holiday camp to talk to the owner of the holiday camp about really not a whole lot other than to say that there's crabs about and there's a king crab and he's trying to get hold of a crab so he can do experiments on it. It's all a bit tenuous. At that point, all he should be doing is obsessing over Pat Benson's bean and working on his camouflage, but he's not, <laughs> apparently... He's, he just happened to go to a holiday camp at that point. I was going to say, am I right? Do they actually explain how the crab ended up in the boat in light? They do, yeah. I must I miss that. But it's, it's quite tenuous, but there is an explanation. <laughs> what is it? Please tell me. I can't remember. It, it, it is just so vague. I think it, it mm. basically just ended up in there and then didn't escape in time and, and then just buried itself in the boating lake. But the, because the, it's possibly King Crab 2, it was trying to sort of plan something. It's the weaker brother, though, wasn't it? The, yeah, the not-so-clever King Crab. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, 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 almost, you, you could kind of get a sensation that like that crab is there. As, he, he either kind of got lost, or he's a scout, mm. or he's doing something because he lays low for a while. But meanwhile, um, Cliff has paid a visit to Manning. And frankly, he doesn't really help the situation because we already know that Manning is thinking I've got a captive audience here they're all going to love it and I'm just going to put on double the amount of shows and they're going to spend twice as much money in the bars but Cliff don't help Manning's expression hardened again but what's going to happen here professor it's the height of the holiday season I've got a full camp and now there's one of these bastards lying doggo in the boating lake can't your depth charge it get the swine that way unfortunately no 
the other attempted to relight his pipe, a blackened bry that was seldom out of his mouth. We don't think it would work. These crabs have an unbelievable resistance to modern weaponry. However, the Shell Island defences were caught napping, but now we're ready for the enemy. The troops surrounding the lake at this moment are all loading up with armour-piercing bullets. I feel sure that once the thing shows itself, it will be blasted to eternity. At least I hope so. Doesn't make for good business, Manning snapped. Most of the folks staying here would be on their way home if they could get out. The moment the roads are opened again, they'll be gone, and they won't be coming back. I guess then I'll be staring bankruptcy in the face. It could have the reverse effect, Davenport smiled through a haze of tobacco smoke. Out there beyond the roadblocks, traffic jams are building up. It seems half the population of Britain wants to catch a glimpse of the crabs. If your existing customers leave, Manning, I'd virtually guarantee that you'll fill your camp again immediately. I was like, for fuck's sake, Cliff. Yeah, look on the bright side. Yeah. <laughs> Can't you in some way discourage Manning from being a money-grubbing <laughs> bastard? No, no, just, just reinforce it. Especially after he's just lost his nephew and uh, his fiance. Yeah, you at least get some sense in Night of the Crabs that is a man experiencing loss and bereavement. Yeah, I mean, obviously, he's, he's quite handily distracted by Pat's bits, but <laughs> you do get the sense that he's responding to to tragedy. You know, whereas in this, he's just he's just popping up, smoking a pipe, going, Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. "I'm Cliff Davenport. You can make, you can make money." Yeah. Yeah. I like the actual introduction of uh, Cliff because the guy goes back to the well-known phrase of aquiline featured man. Yes. Which is, uh, of course. Yeah. 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 And, and I think I think we did pass comment on, on when we talked about Night of the Crabs that the, the description of Cliff Davenport sounds strangely similar <laughs> to how Guy and Smith himself looks in photographs where he never has a pipe, not in his hand. And sometimes, well, in many photographs, he's got two pipes. He's got the one in his mush and the one he's examining. Because he was some kind of champion pipe smoker, wasn't he? He was, yeah. Yeah, he won He, he won the uh, tobacco smoking contest. Wait, when, <laughs> where, uh, yeah, there's a bit in his uh, autobiography where it talks about what that contest is. It's basically just smoking huge amounts of tobacco in a period of time. And people just sort of giving up because they just can't smoke anymore. And you just amazing. have to power through. And uh, it's all in pipes, though. So that's Absolutely okay. Amazing. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's an impressive feat. I think there was one time me and my mate Yaki and my mate Lee took it upon ourselves to try and have that competition ourselves, just the three of us in Lee's flat back in Hull, back in the mists of time where we're all on magic mushrooms. And it culminated in wrapping Rizzlers around two ounce block of drum <laughs> and lighting it <laughs> and trying to smoke it. And uh, I was severely ill. Yeah. So I, I do take my hat off to Guy and Smith. For, is, that, uh, for... is that when Yaki stopped smoking? No, Yaki smoked on for years after that. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I don't know. It's that, it's, it's that weird combination of youth, bravado, magic mushrooms, and the butthole surfers. Good combination. Yeah, but, at least he used to do peculiar things. But Guy was doing this when he was in his, like, 60s. <laughs> oh, yeah. Guy didn't need shrooms. <laughs> Guy didn't need shrooms. Guy just had this fucking down. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Barmouth, Gene falls out with Jerry over his hot dog seller lack of ambition and decides to head back, but she misses a lift and ends up being turned by a, a military roadblock back into town. So for some reason that I can't remember, she falls in with a dirty hippie <laughs> called, called Peter. And because they can't get out, they both hurl up in a boat shed. He sexually assaults her, but she digs it, for fuck's sake, guy, seriously. But fortunately, before it can get too disturbing and out of hand, the crabs attack Barmouth. This is where we now get another repeat of text from Night of the Crabs, where we get the tank lobbing passage from Night of the Crabs. Mm. And we find that um, Jean and the dirty hippie are trapped in the uh, the boat shed, both naked, because they've been at it. He starts slapping her around at this point. But do they escape? Well, we'll see. Because everything in Barmouth is going potty. And, as if by magic, the crab emerges from the boating lake back at the uh, the holiday camp as well, and goes on its own rampage, smashing up armoured cars. 
It doesn't eat anybody. It just <laughs> it just decides to rampage around the army's trucks and armored cars and smashes them all up yeah. in some kind of fit of peak, which you know, fair play, crab. Very grumpy crab. Mm. <laughs> Who do those soldiers think they are? Well, <laughs> this crab doesn't give a fuck about your uniform or your armored cars. And then it sods off back into the sea, much to Miles Manning's relief. Meanwhile, Gordon has helped Ari out with the kids. This is where we get our another repeat of, of, of our Guy N. Smith formula. Man plus woman plus no social distancing rules times Guy N. Smith equals sexual tension. Because no male and female character could interact with each other in this book without getting the steaming hots, either internally, externally, or a combination of all of the above. <laughs> and, yeah. and just during the most mundane, doesn't matter, you got the hots in there. Yeah, so rather than worrying about Jean, he's now got the hots for Irie, because she's not quite a single mother, but she's single in that she's there with her two annoying children. He was going to go find Jean, though, wasn't he? He had to go find his love. Yeah, but he didn't bother, did he? Well, we know what happened there. He went over the wall with the likely lads. Ah, well, yeah, that's that's yet to happen. Whilst he's having a little bit of sexual tension with Irie, which she is encouraging because Irie, because her husband's not there, all she needs is a strong man to be around <laughs> because she cannot cope for 35 seconds being a mother on her own with the children at a holiday camp. She's got to be yeah. trying to score or at the very least, imprint upon any man that even shows the vaguest bit of interest, in this case, Gordon. Whoa, he... whoa, whoa, whoa. Before you go down that one, what? her husband sent her away with the kid, so his yeah. idea of a family holiday is her away with the kid. He told her not that many years ago that he'd had enough of sex, and that they're not old, so, you know, she wasn't having a good life I, I, of it. I have to say, I had a lot of sympathy for Irie. Yeah, I do as well. I I felt, you know, I felt that she was portrayed in quite a good light. Out of all the characters, she's the most sympathetic by by a mile. But you know what? Try marriage counselling before trying to shag Keith Baxter on a beach. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, she felt a lot of guilt for that, though, didn't she? Yeah, Yeah. and she didn't, you know, she didn't do it. Yeah, Yeah. She, she felt so much guilt that the moment Gordon shows up in her chalet, she's she's got the hots for Gordon. But anyway. Yeah, but her husband's an awesome. Yeah, well, and she thinks he's been having affairs as well. Yeah, I thought, yeah, it's indicated he has, I think. Yeah, mm. that she turned a blind eye to things. Yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe he's Wilf Robinson part two. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Irie. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm being too harsh. <laughs> maybe you are. Yeah. I've been to I've been to Butlins. I know what it's like. <laughs> not, not, not as a an Irie or a Keith. Well, just as a... My, my only real experience of, of a holiday camp is holiday on the buses, and they're all trying the best to be at it. Even, even Olive is is trying to get some rumpy pumpy and holiday on the buses. So maybe it is just something to do with with holiday camps. Yeah. I thought you were going to say I've been to Pontins Prestatin. <laughs> well, I, we have been to Pontins Prestatin, haven't we? <laughs> oh God, that was awful. Yeah, well, that was for a sci-fi convention. My mate, Rich, who we were there with, about six weeks after getting back, he texted me and said, put UK Gold on, and Holiday on the Buses was on. <laughs> and it says that Holiday on the Buses was filmed at Pontins Prestatin, <laughs> and it hadn't changed. <laughs> so we were there circa, I don't know, 2010, 2011, something like that. And the fucking players hadn't changed a bit. <laughs> Since since whenever Holiday on the Buses was made, 1976 <laughs> or whatever. But yeah, Pontins yeah. Prestatin was was an interesting experience. Yeah. It's got to be said. But we didn't get the full holiday camp experience with yellow coats no, no, no. or all our business because it was a no. it was a sci fi sci fi convention. So rather than yellow coats, it was blokes walking around dressed as Chewbacca. But That's good. I didn't really get the sense that it was a hotbed of hot rumpy pumpy. Well, not no. for a si- not a sci fi convention. No. no. Definitely no. not. No. No. Certainly not. No. No. But you know, yeah. Mars the pity. Butlins. That's why you get reduced tickets to Butlins in the, in the sun, like yeah. two pounds for the whole weekend and stuff like yeah. that. I, I do <laughs> recall Fairthy getting, and you, you know, I'm sure you won't mind me saying this, Fairthy, but I do recall Fairthy getting the hots for a council estate Wonder Woman. <laughs> so maybe there is something to it. Yeah. Maybe it's maybe it's the environment. I don't know. Mm. 
I'd like yeah. to know if Guy actually went to holiday camp. Yeah. Where did he get his material from? Very good point. It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because how how do you actually do your research for something yeah. like this? Yeah. Reading a bit about him doesn't seem like the uh, holiday camp kind of guy. But when when we did the show with Andrew Nett, we were talking about the uh, the punk and skin the sorry the skinhead books that New English Library published, and apparently the guy who wrote those all the skinhead movement and all that kind of youth subculture all thought that he must have been part of the subculture, but it just turned out he was a Canadian hack writer who took some of them for a drink one afternoon in London <laughs> and then wrote a whole a whole series of books about the skinhead culture. So, who knows? Me- me- maybe he saw Holiday on the Buses. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, Heidi High. I yeah. Maybe, Heidi maybe, that, maybe that was his research. Yeah. Actually, when did Heidi High come out? Must have, been, must have been around about this, wasn't it? It was oh, 84, God. this, wasn't it? Yes, and Heidi High was definitely 80s, wasn't it? Yeah, there we go. Mm, yeah, maybe Heidi High did its research from Crab's Moon. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably more complicated than that. We might have to do a PowerPoint slide to show the, the interaction between Holiday on the Buses, Heidi High, and Crab's Moon. What were the interdependencies and interrelationships between those, those three things? And how did they all get it right? And how did they all get it wrong? Yeah, I'll do. I'll do that. I'll do that next week when I'm bored at work. <laughs> so anyway, uh, chapter ten, we found out about Benji, and this is something of a face palm moment. Yeah, in this book, and I'm not going to try and pretend that Guy and Smith books or James Herbert books or Sean Hudson books are, are ever something that should be taken seriously. But if you want a, a, like a an encapsulation of how wrong-headed attitudes were to things like learning disability in the 70s and 80s. This is a pretty good example. Oh, is it Benji? We, you called him Barney on your Oh, sorry. Team. Yeah, Benji. Oh, did I call him Barney on the slide? It's yeah. Benji, isn't it? Yeah, oh. Benji. Barnaby was the, um, yeah. the beach karma. Yeah. So, yeah, we've got this situation with Benji where he's, I think, it, does his mother refer to him as a Mongol? And his dad says, yeah, he's, that, not, he's not a Mongol. Don't yeah. call him a Mongol. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's later on. You see that you, you don't get that early on, but it's uh, no. but it does indicate the attitude of the time, doesn't it? it really yeah. does. Yeah, yes. that's that's when he's died, isn't it? Yeah. So it's it's uh, not not guy's finest hour. No, this chapter, I don't think. But but we find out that there's this lad Benji who has learning disabilities, and this is one of the interesting things about how kind of wrong-headed some of the descriptions are in the, from this era, is that actually whenever they're describing, it's his attitude, it's the attitude of his mother and the attitude of his parents and a couple of anecdotes about him putting his hand up someone's skirt, yeah. even though there was no sexual motivation behind it, that portrays Benji as some kind of, kind of degenerate. But then actually all the descriptions of what he does, he just sounds like a 12-year-old kid. Yeah, playing yeah. cowboys and playing sheriff it's, it's curious you know it's easy to read stuff like this now with a with a modern eye but but his, his his dad does admit that he did put his hand up the skirt and it was he was becoming a teenager it was his hormones uh, and, and also you know some of the sort of descriptions here are very clumsy from guy but there is that indication of parents that are kind of again broken parents that are mm. really snobby they can't they, they can't accept what's happened yeah and they can't cope with the situation and it, yeah. and there's there's no sympathy with the parents no 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 not at all in, in any way and, and the way guys written it there's no sympathy for the parents he's, yeah. he's made them out as being you know just wrong isn't he? yeah yeah that is that is true from very very early on it yeah. was like they felt they were better than they were yeah but as you got to know them it was something that the mum felt she needed to do and dad just kind of went along with it. Mm. Yeah, quite a sad family. Very sad. Yeah, you know what? Just listening to you know your your take on that makes me kind of reevaluate. It's it's easy to get kind of outraged by the outdated attitudes, but actually, you do make a very very valid point in that. In no way is he sympathising with those parents and their terrible attitudes to their son. No, no. It, it... The way I read it, he's, he's more sympathising with Benji. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point. And at the end of the day, Benji just wants to be the town sheriff. Yeah. Doesn't he? Meanwhile, Cliff Davenport calls Miles. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's because he's Cliff, isn't it? 
yeah, he's just got to got to get back in touch. Uh, Miles Manning fumbled for his cigar box. It was empty. There's unrest in the camp. A small crowd tried to break out through the main gates. The soldiers had to stop them at gunpoint, but there are dozens of other places where they could make it on foot. I reckon some of them will try it after dark. If they do, then it can't be helped, Davenport replied. The armed forces and police are stretched beyond their limits. God, you ought to see Barmouth. The crabs have wrecked the seafront and some of the debris are still burning. Reinforcements have come in, but I'm afraid artillery is no good. I'm working the clock round to try and come up with something more subtle. Christ, they must have an Achilles heel. Finding it's the problem. The sooner I get a dead crab to work on, the better. Anyway, seeing as yours got away, there's no point in me coming over. I'll keep in touch, though. <laughs> like, thanks, Cliff. <laughs> thanks for the help. But, of course, Miles references there um, a bunch of guys trying to break out the camp. And this is Gordon has fallen in with a bunch of uh, likely lads led by a, a, a bloke who fancies himself a little bit called Charlie. Gordon is now in this position where he's like, right, what shall I do? Shall I shall I make a break for it? He's not thinking, I need to make a break for it to go and find Jing. <laughs> I think I think he's thinking, I need to make a break for it because, God damn it, I'm fed up of this holiday camp. And even at the point where Ari's like, what, are you going to go then? He's, yeah, she's like, well, here's, here's my contact details. And he says, <laughs> well, I might contact you after all this is over. So you don't think he was going for Jean? He all, he kind of like he, he was. She was his true love. Did I did I miss that? Is is he trying to escape so he can go and get Jean? Yeah, that's why yeah, he's going yeah, that's, to that's why, Yeah, that's why he's going. Yeah. All oh, right. Well, fair play to him then. Yeah, I've, mis, not, not I've for, misjudged him. Not for himself. Yeah. He's looking for looking for Jean. Yeah. Just looking, yeah. looking for something. Yeah. He doesn't know where she is. Just in Bamberth. <laughs> Right. Okay. Fair play to uh, fair play to to Gordon yeah. then. So as it happens, Jean, your sister. Yeah. 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 As it as it happens, Jean <laughs> did escape the boat shed into burning Barmouth. But what happened to the dirty hippie? We wonder. Well, we'll soon find out. Right. Can, can I just interject here? Yeah. Because there's a reference in Night of the Crabs about that boathouse burning there is. down. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, um, yeah. Jean and the dirty hippie were. Um, basically having violent sex, and he was slapping her about in that very boat shed. Gene Ruddington ran, stopped, saw the crabs for the first time. Oh, God almighty, she had to be dreaming. A hallucination. Weird shapes cast by the leaping flames. No, they were real all right. They had halted because they had caught a victim. Paused because they could not resist human flesh and blood. She screamed. At least she thought she did, but the sound went unheard in this unholy din. She recognised the struggling naked form for one fleeting instant as it was held aloft in crushing pincers, the crustaceans fighting among themselves for their prize. A man whose sheer physical strength was as nothing compared with theirs. The body was held at full stretch by an arm and a leg, the free limbs kicking and flailing wildly. She felt the sinews snap, the members being ripped from their sockets. A third crab shambled forward, snatched and got a hold on the trunk. It was like huge scissors struggling to cut through thick material, finally making it. The body was severed, pulled apart, blood gushing like a burst geezer. I really like that scissor metaphor. <laughs> I think it's excellent because you can almost hear and feel the pressure of the scissors on thick cardboard and translate it. to. It's a really, really great metaphor. I love that. But yeah, unlucky hippie. Yeah. <laughs> Bloody it's, hippie. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I just love that. It's ace. He gets his comeuppance. He's, he's, he's a dirty pervert. He's violent, and he gets his comeuppance off some do, crabs. And doesn't he tell her to run? Didn't he try to help her in the last his last few breaths? To what extent are, are we going to give people a break? He was trying to escape by himself. Yes. He was, he, you know, uh, I, yeah, I've got no sympathy for him. No, no I haven't, but I think it, it's the last <laughs> deed. What he did was more than sexual assault, but yeah, the uh, yeah, the, 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 the the vicious slapping <laughs> probably probably laid on <laughs> ladled on another layer. Uh, the ages of everything you got, but she makes it back to Jerry's house. He's gone, but she lays low and listens to the carnage outside, and uh, yeah. and and gets some kip. Don't know where Jerry's gone. He's evacuated. Yeah. Jer- Jerry's about the only per- person in this in this book where you don't really find out their fate. Yeah. He just, he just like maybe another book. Well, Jerry's. yeah, what, 
what we need is Crab's Weekend. <laughs> we find out where Jerry sets up his next hot dog stall. Yeah. Oh, no, Orkman. Yeah. I've seen him there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ari is disappointed as Gordon decides he's making that night break with the likely lads, but he does take a number just in case he survives, because, of course, you've got to hedge your bets, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. But, but, uh, but down at the beach, he, he spots Benji tailing him, and when he gets to the beach, he realises that actually Benji is on the tail of Gordon and the likely lads. He and, knew uh, early on he could have done something, I'm sorry, but... yeah. He could, not he, impressed. He, he didn't really make any efforts to kind of shoo him back, or did he? Did he? Does he say like "go back, kid"? Can't remember. Yeah, he was a green coat. He's, he should have done more than that. Yes, he was yes. a green coat. He, he should have been looking after Benji, shouldn't he? I, I do actually love this chapter. It's brilliant because, and, and it would make if you're thinking about Night of, um, Crab's Moon the movie. This for me would be the champagne scene. Yeah. With which chapter are we on here? Uh, so this is chapter twelve. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The shore. Yeah, so they're making the bid for freedom along the beach and, and Gordon's distracted thinking about Irie and he's acknowledging <laughs> that he should really be worried about Gene, but he isn't. And he's mulling over Irie's admission about him going for hot beach sex with Keith, although she didn't because he got his knob pulled off and was eaten. But then he realises that he's turned on by the thought of Irie at it with strange men because in a way it mirrors his wife knobbing Wilf Robinson or something. Bizarre, but all, man. But, but all of his odd musings on what he's turned on by... <laughs> And why and what he wants from his sex life are uh, are interrupted because it turns out that the likely lads have all been making the way over the boulders. <laughs> you know, them boulders that you get on Welsh beaches <laughs> that turn out to be crabs laying low and, and playing doggo. And then uh, and then the crabs just pop up and it's like, oh shit, we're on the back of giant crabs. <laughs> and they all get eaten, and it's brilliant. And they all get eaten in horrific fashion including poor Benji. And poor Benji tries to take on King Crab with his finger pistols. His finger pistols. His finger pistols. Bless him. Bless him. Poor Benji. And uh, and this is the point at which Gordon falls down a crevasse. <laughs> a crevasse that happens to be on a Welsh beach. Clickety-click, clickety-click, click. <laughs> That's what yeah. saved him, wasn't it? To yeah. carry on in the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we don't we don't know at that point as he survived. He just kind yeah. of falls into yeah. oblivion. Those famous crevasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. But yeah, you know, this is a good scene for Benji, though, right? He's he's just going for it, isn't he? Oh yeah, Benji, totally. Yeah. He's just yeah. like this is this is it. Yeah, this is my power, my he's, secret power. He's the sheriff. This is yeah. his moment. My yeah. secret power. Yeah. But unfortunately, he gets horrendously disemboweled <laughs> and eaten yeah. by crabs. Gordon could have done more. He could have. Benji should never have been there. But, uh, alas, poor Benji, um, you deserve better. And this is, of course, where we get the couple of lasses, who you mentioned earlier. Uh, So a couple of girls down the disco, tap off with some fellas, and it's Lucy and... Edna. The other name. Edna. (laughs) Edna and Lucy. I think it's Lucy goes off for an alfresco shag with one of the lads near the donkey enclosure. Poor donkeys. I don't think there's particularly any surprise that the donkeys get eaten by giant crabs. Well, it's sad, look. though. <laughs> it is It is sad. Yeah. But if it's not bad enough that Lucy, not only the guy who's shagging her is an horrible prick. Yep. He's got some teeth missing as well, which is guy, yeah. guy indicates. You know, he's very conscious by you know, describing the fact he's got teeth missing. Yeah. He's not a nice fella at all. He's really horrible to her which uh, she just does not deserve at all. And then, sadly, she gets, you know, mostly naked, tries to escape, gets strung up on some barbed wire. Of course, yeah. Mm. So Johnny is been munched on, as have all of the donkeys, by the crabs, and she's strung up on some barbed wire. And it says, the wire strand sagged. In a last futile gesture of self-survival, she pressed herself back against the fence the barbs digging cruelly into her flesh as though they were trying to prevent her from being dragged down. She was trying to scream, gurgling, crying. Warm acid water trickled down between her legs. The big crab shambled forward, halted a couple of yards from her. His revolting features appeared to crease into a lusting grin. Even the crabs are perverts. I know. (laughs) Why lusting? Yeah. Not needed. The other crustaceans held back. It would take a brave and foolish crab to try and deprive their master of his rightful prey. 
As a cat plays with a mouse, so King Crab began to taunt Lucy. Sadistically, he stretched out a pincer and she shrank back as far as the tension of the barbed wire would allow, gouging her shoulder blades and buttocks, the blood beginning to run freely. He touched her, scratched her breast, drew a dark red line all the way down her abdomen as though marking her out for mutilation. <laughs> a clump of coarse hair. Somehow he secured a grip, tugged, and the tuft came out by the roots. Is he on about her bush there? Is King Crab pulling yeah. on her bush? Yeah, Incredible. I don't think that's the indication. Incredible. Lucy screamed with pain, would have fallen had the barbs not been impaled in her flesh. Her arms stretched wide as though in crucifixion. She wanted to close her eyes, shut it all out, but some awful compelling force made her watch. She had abandoned all hope. Afraid of death all of her life, she suddenly wanted to die. Kill me, please. The crab touched her again. It seemed curious concerning the human anatomy, prodding and poking, drawing more blood, perhaps unintentionally, with its exploratory probings. <laughs> Lucy's head fell forward and her eyes closed with sublime unconsciousness. King Crab seemed to sense that she was no longer participating in this game of blood and pain, but there was no point in further torture. The pincer struck again, venomously this time, disemboweling the girl with a single blow. Entrails spilled from the abdominal gash, swung gently to and fro, a crustacean titbit. Once more, it was a revolting game, the monster crab catching the swinging human offal in its mouth, sucking the slimy warm intestines in the manner of a human eating spaghetti. <laughs> Noisily, there was no hurry. <laughs> oh, Lucy, this is really fucking... It's a bit harsh, that, isn't it? Yeah. A bit harsh yeah. enough to put you off spaghetti. Yeah. Well... Well, that's um, seafood and spaghetti. Yeah, can't eat anything there. So not not only <laughs> not only is King Crab a massive knobhead, he's also a fucking dirty crab pervert. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. Interesting thing about the, the donkeys. Just yeah. a side note: the guy they used to keep donkeys, rescue donkeys, and stuff yeah. like that. So he was a big donkey fan. So I was surprised that the donkeys got killed. I thought they every, ev everybody's escaped. fair game in Guy World. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, everybody. Yeah, but it was cruel. Donkeys are lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at least they didn't get fiddled with by King Crab. <laughs> or maybe they did. Maybe you just didn't describe it. I no, know. I think they just got eaten. Mm. So at this stage, this this is the point at which I put this book down and and didn't pick it up again for for about a week. And <laughs> Phil was saying, "Have you read it yet? Have you finished it yet? Have you read it yet? We need to talk about the end." <laughs> I was like, "Right, okay." So <clears throat> when I picked it up again, well, by God, this is at the point is like, all right, let's just get this shit done. <laughs> so I've written 220 pages. Let's just get this shit over with. So <laughs> chapter 14, Jean just has to try and walk back to the holiday car. Oh, and then to cut a long story short, she gets run over by a crashing army truck. <laughs> Unlucky Jean. <laughs> You've been through all that. You've been through everything. You've been fingered by soldiers in a lorry. You've had to put up with Jerry and his lack of ambition. You've been assaulted by a dirty hippie and had to run naked through town after watching him get eaten. You've survived the attack on Barmouth. All this, and she gets run over by a crashing lorry. <laughs> Poor Jade. Like, fucking hell. It's just, it just, it just amazing. And that's that's just the first <laughs> of the oh my god moments at the end of this book. <laughs> Cliff Davenport again pops up, and and Grizzly Greasdale pops up oh, as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Th they're musing over King Crab's behaviour at the camp, and then Gordon's alive. We find <laughs> so Gordon. We find oh, yeah. that he fell into a beach crevice or something, and, and yeah, and the crabs couldn't get at him, so he gets back to the camp. And uh, Manning fires him. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he didn't go to his show. <laughs> no, he didn't. Right, yeah. Manning's like, where the fuck are you been? He's like, I've been upside down in a crevice. Like, not good enough. You're yeah. fired. It's like Alan Sugar moment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and quite apart from anything else, I reckon Manning went, what? A crevice on a Welsh beach? <laughs> fuck off. You're fired. You're fired for coming up with a shit excuse. <laughs> ben, Manning shows his true colours, decides to hop the island with his loot, 
So he's taking all his loot out of the out of the safes. And uh, Gordon, meanwhile, has got a plan. He's got a plan to protect Arya and the kids. So so Gordon, to some degree, comes good towards the end because he's got this plan. He's pretty confident about it. And then we'll get the final chapter. And all I could say is, in your fucking face, reader, because this final <laughs> chapter is like, it's it's it's. Uh, uh, if it wasn't so funny, if I did if I didn't laugh when I read it and found it hugely amusing, I would have felt quite offended by the amount of time I'd invested in this book. But actually, it was really funny. So Manning heads to the docks with his loot, and a soldier tries to stop him, and he he has an heart attack and dies. <laughs> And there's Gordon, Irie, and the kids hide in a concrete pipe, and they're all really scared. And the crabs, the crabs do turn up, but then they just fuck off, <laughs> and they survive. The end. <laughs> no, but I knew, I, I knew when you finished because you laughed how I did in the last couple of sentences. It's just, it's just absolutely you got, amazing. You got... Please, somebody read Andy, the last read the sentence. La- Please, you got to read the last, the last yeah. sentence. Yes. Yeah. Andy, you do. You, your Please. voice is so good. Last paragraph. Right. The last paragraph. Please. <laughs> okay. Like Napoleon and later Hitler, when they had marched their respective troops on Russia, the giant crabs had grossly mistimed their attack on the Blue Ocean holiday camp. Reckon they'll open the road soon. There was a hint of regret in Gordon's voice. It was crazy. You built yourself up to a peak of frustration to get out of the camp, but suddenly you didn't want to go. For himself and Ari, it could be a parting of the ways. It'll maybe take a day or two, though. Yes, I expect so. Somehow her hand found his between the clinging bodies of Rodney and Louise. You'll stay with us until they do, won't you, Gordon? His heart seemed to miss a beat. There was no mistake in her tone of hope, fear that he might decide to lodge elsewhere, or just leave. Of course I will. He gave her hand an answering squeeze. Maybe this time she wouldn't insist on sleeping with Louise. A lot of things could be a whole lot different from now onwards. <laughs> and suddenly, amidst the debris, the Blue Ocean holiday camp seemed the most marvellous place on earth. I can't believe he wrote that. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. And they all lived... Happily ever after. They all lived happily ever after. <laughs> but then you get this you get this wonderful author's note. I, imagine, if you will, that you pick Crab's Moon up from a library, or you're in a B&B and Crab's or in a holiday cottage, and Crab's Moon is the only book on the shelf. And on a windswept night in your holiday cottage, you read Crab's Moon, and that's the end. There's no climax to the Crab story at all, but you get author's note, and it says, Following the attack on the Blue Ocean holiday camp, the giant crabs moved back to Barmouth, where they demolished the viaduct over the estuary and more lives were lost. It was Professor Cliff Davenport who finally defeated them, matching strength and cunning with ingenuity and rid the Welsh coast of danger. This story is related in Night of the Crabs. <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, just, just astonishing. Between Night of the Crabs and that, Guy and Smith, I think we said on, on the last show, is, or the Halloween show anyway, is um, someone whose book covers I saw, but I never read anything by him. He just always passed me by. But I've got to say, the combination of Night of the Crabs and Crabs Moon is possibly the most unique one-two punch <laughs> I've ever come across in reading. Yeah. Crabs Moon doesn't solve anything, does it? No. It doesn't no. answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, not at all. Not at but all. It, but it's addictive because we had to share a copy and I couldn't wait for him any longer. So I started reading, had my own bookmark, and in the end, I just had to finish it. Yeah. And then, I, and like he said, I was like, have you finished yet? I want to talk about the last <laughs> chapter, the last few mm. pages, the last paragraph. But it was not until he laughed I knew he'd finished. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would sum up Crab's Moon. As a standalone book, not as part of that one-two punch, I would I would sum up Crab's Moon as it's a book about infidelity and sex as a miserable circle of traps that giant crabs just join as an occasional additional <laughs> pitfall. It's nine parts middle-aged sexual angst and one part knobhead crab attacks. Yeah, basically, yeah. Stare yeah. and enjoy. This, yeah. 
marriage counseling. That's what you need. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I've got to say, I am so glad I read it though. I am. And like you say, it's not as much about the crabs. Yeah, that's right. And you know what we've got lined up as well, Phil, potentially. Uh, you, you're going to do it on air. You're going to make me read another, aren't you? Oh. The origins of the crabs. The, or- the origin of the crabs is right here waiting uh. for us. <laughs> and we have to share a copy again. They're like 15 quid a pop. Okay, we'll share it's not, like, it's not like the rats where you can get one for 10 bob and a pickled egg. Uh, yeah. And they don't take long to read. No, no, no they don't. You can't, you can't buy them on uh, Kindle or thing like that. They're like two quid or so. But uh, Origins of Crab is very good. Is ah, it? Yeah. Well, I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Look, I don't want to spoil I don't want to spoil it, but it, it's just it's just because it's before everything. Yeah. Right. But, I, I did wonder where they came from, so yeah. yeah. Well, that's why you wrote it. Everyone was like, where do they come from? It's like, shit, I better write a book of where they came from. I've I've got high hopes for Crabs the Human Sacrifice as well. That's only because you like the picture. Oh, yeah. That is a a brilliant one. The the best thing about that is where the idea came from that, why he wrote it. It wasn't wasn't his... his, He he didn't come up with the idea. Someone in the publishing house said, why don't you do this? He's like, that sounds a bit far fetched. All right, then. <laughs> brilliant. Just, just wrote it. Absolutely brilliant. I bet he wrote it in like three days as well. Yeah. Like that. that sounds ridiculous. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so that was Crab's Moon, and I think it would be remiss of us. I think we're recording this a year after Guy was admitted to hospital with an infection, and very sadly died of COVID on Christmas Eve last year. I think it would be remiss of us not to just talk a little bit about Guy in a little bit more detail and just more broadly. What do we know about him? We said earlier that he started his career, he was still working at Midland Bank when he was doing things and he he would get his his friend Pat to type these things up. His first published book, Care of New England Library, was Werewolf by Moonlight in 1974, which has got that wonderful cover which uh, looks like it was a photograph of Guy and Smith doctored <laughs> to make him look like a werewolf. Yeah, Aquilin <laughs> features. Aquilin featured werewolf, yeah. <laughs> is, is that one that you've read? I have read that, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, it's, it's so obviously, because Guy, Guy and Smith was very much into um, shooting game yeah. and stuff like that. And that whole book is basically about someone visiting the borders of, of Wales, uh, going shooting which is what he did at that time yeah. so it's basically and he was and, and the character is a would-be journalist right who, who's into shooting <laughs> so it's just him like yeah basically he's the main character is just him um but yeah it's a it's an interesting book and the reason he did it someone just said oh there's an interest in werewolves why don't you write this story and he just knocked up a, a synopsis sent it off and they're like yeah let's do it yeah <laughs> I think within days, you just it's like a Moorcock thing, isn't it? Just writing a book within days, just yeah. knocking it, knocking them out. Yeah. And he, and he was knocking them out at, at such a pace that after Night of the Crabs became like the massive hit seller that it was, it, they started signing him to three book contracts. Yeah. yeah. And he was, he was knocking out those ridiculously quickly. And it got to the point where not only was he right knocking those out ridiculously quickly, he was getting them in a month before deadline. <laughs> and uh and he hit a point where NEL couldn't actually keep up with him in terms of publication. So he ended up writing for Hamlin yeah, yeah. as well. And he was also b- before he published Night of the Crabs and kind of hit the big time in that respect, not only was he writing for Grotbags, but as you pointed out to me a while back, that uh, he actually um, wrote Disney novelizations. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, under a pseudonym. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there is there is an anecdote in that interview where where he talks about getting getting off a train, being put, picked up and chauffeur driven to Pinewood Studios to have a private viewing of Song of the South. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then going back and writing the novelization of Song of the South, which is absolutely amazing. Yeah, this guy but, has such such a life. But that, that that was from I think that was a, a Nell contract, wasn't it? I think yeah. they were doing that, and he was like, oh, "I'd like to try that." And like, oh, yeah, go on then. <laughs> and he was like, "Yeah, there we go." 
but then he also wrote his series of children books which are all about wildlife and I started reading them to my kids and they're not like um what's the name Richard Adams they're not like Watership yeah. Down where there's sort of like a you know dialogue between the animals this is literally just animals yeah. describe you know, their lives and stuff and they're incredibly detailed and it's really well written yeah. and it's it's just um you know I've got this one here uh so rack rack the urban fox basically it's rack the fox and his mate shy lived on a railway embankment in the middle of a concrete jungle with trains roaring by every day to and from towering city skies rack and shy scavenged from dustbins for food and never felt hungry then one day some well-meaning humans captured them drove them out to the scrublands to set them free in the countryside in alien surroundings with no knowledge of hunting nor any instinct for self-preservation rack will have to fight hard to stay alive <laughs> it's just, it's, you know, it's, and reading it is actually it's, it's quite a compelling book you know it's very different yeah. obviously from crabs and, and bamboo gorilla and all that sort of stuff yeah it's, it's, you know, there's not the gore and stuff like that but it's because he knew about the countryside and he lived in the countryside and he he wrote all the books about you know um all, all the sort of hunting books he's into yeah which was yeah I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily into hunting but growing up in the countryside i, I was aware of you know that that side of things yeah but big but because of his knowledge of that the way he writes these these this sort of um fiction about the countryside animals and stuff like that is it's just it's just really just really real basically yeah it's just you know it's quite solid so yeah. well, what do your children think yeah they did they enjoy them they they did enjoy it it, it get uh, i had to sort of reread it i pre-read it because <laughs> it, it really isn't <laughs> You know, it is it is a child's book, but it isn't a child's book if that makes sense. It, right. It, it's it's quite harsh. It's it's quite yeah. real. Yeah. But it, you know, it hasn't got all that sort of gore and stuff that he writes in his you know horror stuff like that. But it's um, but it's it's really well written. Hmm. Yeah. So it's still a gritty tale of urban survival from the perspective of a fox. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, is so. incredibly versatile portfolio at the end of the day, hasn't he? And you know, the, the, I think the saddest thing, you know, it's, I mean, it's always sad to hear that somebody passed, but he was still at it as well, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, he'd, yeah. He'd, I think he'd written uh, another Sabbat novel. Yeah, he, he had, um, he still had plans to to publish more via Black Hills books. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was, it was, it was still going. You know, yeah. it was, it was, he was still, was still motoring. Uh, early eighties. Early eighties, yeah, eighty seven. Yeah. 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 And um on, on your prompting, I also did pick up writing horror fiction by Guy yeah. and Smith. Yes. Which um <laughs> the, the, there is a very brief passing mention of um of his his attitude to the likes of Sean Hudson oh, in yeah, there, yeah. which is quite amusing, yeah. but but very, very controlled. You really get the sense that he was actually a really nice guy as yeah. well, and a, yeah. and a real family man. And then, of course, the other one I picked up off eBay at Yar. <laughs> yeah. Practical, Practical country, country living. living. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's actually that like a, the good life. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great book. It really is. There's some. There's some very uh, sort of uh, pressing things in there. You know, he's talking about um, when. We, when was it published? Eighties, was it? Eighty-eight. Yeah. Yeah. So th there's a bit where he's talking about his neighbour. It's got some solar panels, uh, but but to heat the water, and then he talks about the um, the efficiency of them and whether it is whether it's worth installing them. Yeah. And then there's an, another bit where he's talking very in detail about um, using pendulums for divining, whether foods had um, sort of dodgy ingredients in them, so whether they had sort of additives that weren't good for you and stuff like that. So he'd yeah. use the pendulum and say, "Well, I'm not going to eat that." And <laughs> and the way that the, the, the the food he was eating, was, or you know, his family were eating, was all organic. It was all organic food, and and the only meat he, he ate was game that he caught. So he wouldn't eat red meat or anything like that. So it was only stuff that he went out and caught. So it was it was very it sounds very wholesome, you know. It's you yeah. Know, it's it's not like um, hunting for the for the fun of it. It's hunting for. It's living off the land, isn't it? You're living off yeah. the land, yeah, and yeah, and that's what it describes. 
But I think the best bit is where he's, he's talking about alternative uh, sort of ways of earning money. And his was, apart from writing very successful horror fiction, was um, a secondhand book mm. company where he was buying and selling books and selling them online. It, not online, actually. It was mail order, wasn't it, at the time? Yeah. Yeah. And he, he, um, ran, a, he ran a comic and bookshop as well, didn't he? he, he I think yeah, Black yeah. Hill Books, the name of that, comes from the comic and bookshop he bought off uh, an old. I think it was like an old ex-priest acquaintance <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just just bought a load of stuff, didn't he? Just yeah. selling it. Yeah. yeah so. And uh and, and rather rather lovely. He uh, you've you've got his wine recipes as well. Yeah. For for blackberry wine, elderberry <laughs> wine. Yeah. It's full recipes for blackberry wine, elderberry wine, gooseberry wine, and rowanberry and wheat wine. Mmm. We should try his elderberry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely should. that would yeah. be the ultimate tribute to Guy and Smith, wouldn't it? Yeah, um, it's only thing a lot of my my dad's elderberry wine, probably disgusting, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's anything like my dad's elderberry wine, it'll be fucking rocket fuel. And and, and, and my rock- granddad's was amazing, yeah. bless him. Yeah. yeah, when my dad was making elderberry wine, it was um, it was like he would put it in a jug, an earthenware jug, and put it on the on the kitchen table with with our Sunday dinner. <laughs> so the earthenware jug would get thumped down on the table, and you were drinking it. It was in, and it was it was like drinking pot. It's like drinking yeah, yeah. a really rich pot, and you'd just be shit first forty five minutes later. <laughs> yeah, absolutely incredible, yeah. incredible stuff. So, Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, really, really fascinating bloke. He wrote nonfiction. He was. He, I think, like a lot of his contemporaries, a lot of his gear is in some ways has aged quite badly. But there's there's a jaunt to his writing. That, that I think explains why he was so successful at the time. But I, I do wonder if one of the reasons why where James Herbert and Sean Hudson remain in print and quite easy to find, a lot of the Guy and Smith stuff maybe has just got a little bit harder to publish now just because of some of those, you know, sex, in particular the sexual violence stuff, that because the, it, it can veer quite wildly in, in a very, very short space of time, in, a, in, in the space of a few lines, from entertaining pulp to being verging on, if not fully, kind of quite distasteful. Yeah. Um, but it, he was a writer for hire. Yeah. And he was he was churning out genre fodder. And, and that bit in that interview where he talks about Peter Herning, he, he did Bamboo Gorillas. And Phil, Bamboo Gorillas was... There was, there was a subgenre of pulp fiction, of war fiction, which was quite popular in Australia, but not so much over here, which was about prisoners of war in the hands of the Japanese. And generally there would be a combination of nurses and prisoners of war being subjected to terrible treatment by their Japanese captors. And and there was a lot of rape and a lot of, um, you know, kind of unpleasant stuff. But he was writing that stuff because Pete Herning said, how far can you push it? Yeah, and Peter Herning encouraged him to push it. So he was a writer for hire, and he was he was churning out all of that genre fodder in some ways to order, and pushing the envelope as far as he could because it because it was selling. Yeah. yeah. So you is know, that why they were saying how far will you push it? Because they wanted yeah. him to push yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so they asked him to write a couple of biker novels because NEL was doing a lot of a lot of biker books. I mentioned that I started a um, one called I think Angels from Hell which is one of the um, NEL biker books. Yeah. And fucking hell, the, the first three chapters of that, well, anything that Guy and Smith can throw into the mix in terms of sexual violence and, and things that might raise an eyebrow these days, well, the first three chapters of that Angels from Hell book completely yeah. knock it out of the park from that perspective. Yeah. Um, and he also did he did two uh, books on you know, trucks, didn't he? Uh, on the sort of, uh, sort of um, <laughs> trucks transport scene wasn't it? there was a yeah. uh, tv series about um sort of truckers and stuff like that mm. and, he, and he wrote two two novels on that and what he really wanted to do was have a series on like a a, a sort of western series didn't he like a cowboy series yeah and he wrote one uh i think it's called what's it called pony riders right um and he wanted to do a whole series like like edge yeah uh, on that that kind of thing but i think he j- he'd kind of just missed the boat on that Mm. so you know he, he was just a bit after that was popular so it, it didn't quite happen yeah i, I don't say he was a writer for hire but he was very diverse because not every writer can write in different areas either yeah i think that was the deal it was like you know people would say can you do this and go yeah 
and then just do it and then send him an 150 quid check yeah and that's that's how he ended up writing for the writing for the drop mags but again another interesting thing from that is that while he was doing that graham masterton was was the editor of a of a porn mag called forum <laughs> so it, it wasn't just guy and smith it seems like it's there were but, writers out there. Yeah. If there was writing to be done, they would write it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 it didn't matter what it was. Yeah. You know, because because Graham Masterton was he was less prolific, but Graham Masterton's another really really kind of interesting British horror author. I mean, Graham Masterton's books are quite easy to get hold of. Uh, they're they're not hard to get hold of in the same way that Guy and Smith books are. But he's another e- e- equally interesting, you know, British horror novelist that. I know next to nothing about. Yeah. yeah. A few years ago, we went to a sci-fi weekend and he was supposed to be one of the guests there. So I took my Devils of D-Day sphere paperback that I got off Pops, hoping to get him to sign it, but he, he never ended up going due to ill health. And um, and I don't know if he's still around. But yeah. In fact, Devils of D-Day was, was on our um, poll for the but Halloween the list, special. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe next year. But, but yeah, with, with Guy, uh, he, one of his main incomes for many years i think it was about 15 years this going from his uh classic yes autobiography oh, yeah. pipe dreams um he's <laughs> talking about the uh the countryman weekly which he had been right he was from he was writing for 15 years wow wow and that was you know every week he was writing things about you know it's about sort of shotguns yeah and things like that but you know he was just writing for that so he he was a prolific writer doesn't matter mm. What he was writing, he was just writing. They mm-hmm. called him the Great Scribbler, didn't they? That was his. That was his name. He, yeah. he just wrote. Well, he was, he, he was just anything. An absolute machine, wasn't he? So yeah. I'd, I'd be really interested to take a look at some of his later output. I think maybe nineties onwards to see to mm. see how that stuff reads. I'm going to have to take a look and and take a deeper dive into his bibliography and see what he was doing in the nineties. But not until I've read the Sucking Pit, just because I've got to read <laughs> the Sucking Pit because it's such a brilliant yeah. name. What's but, that about? <laughs> In that interview, he says that there was, and he actually says there was an actual sucking pit behind where he lived, and it was where a bomb had fallen in World War Two and created a crater that had filled in with like water and algae and goo, mm. and um, and parents would warn them that if they fell in, they would just sink, and there was no bottom to it, so they were all terrified of it. So he ended up writing a novel called The Sucking Pit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, the 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 first book I ever wrote, read of his was uh, Throwbacks, which is um, it's, it's a great book actually, from from what I remember. And it was, it was when I was a teenager, I just saw it in a um, a secondhand book fair and just picked it up. And was just like, oh. and and that's where that's what got me hooked onto Guy and Smith. I read that, and then I started reading some of his crab books. Yeah. Um, but the Throwbacks is effectively it's a it's a zombie novel. You know, mm. it's a, a chemical weapon goes off and people become effectively like they they, they regress, so they become primitives. Um, so they sort of go back genetically; they go back to sort of primitive times. Yeah. Um, and and it was written in the eighties, so it was that sort of whole Cold War uh, period, um, mm. similar to is that one which I haven't read yet actually, uh, called the Warhead or something, which is just it's absolutely bonkers, which is <laughs> about. About nuclear weapons and sort of um uh sort of uh, voodoo voodoo <laughs> gods. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yeah. That sounds uh, amazing. But one area he never really wrote in was uh science fiction, which yeah. I don't think he was ever into science fiction. No. Yeah. No. But everything he just write, you know, notwithstanding the fact that giant crabs, it <laughs> it is all very grounded, isn't it? Because he, yeah. even his choice of location, he tends to locate things in real places. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. he doesn't make towns up. No, no, no. Yeah, no. He's, he's he has a fairly grounded approach to everything. I mean, you know, okay, so some some kind of elements of 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 detail sometimes seem a bit sloppy and rushed. It's like in in Night of the Crabs, the tank that gets thrown in the harbor. Um, there's no mention of what kind of tank it is, but then in in Crabs Moon, there's a reference to it being a Churchill tank, which I think is the wrong timing. I think. Well, yeah, yeah, wrong uh, decade. Yeah, yeah. yeah Ch- Churchill <laughs> tanks went out of service in like 1944 or something, yeah, yeah. Or 1943. Yeah, yeah. So he would have gone. He should have gone for a, a chieftain. That would have yeah, been right. A yeah. chieftain, or, or I don't know what 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 were the tanks we were all obsessed with when we were kids? Scorpion tanks. Yeah. And, well, and my dad, he, my dad was in the tank regiment. Right. Um, and in the seventies, yeah, and he, he was driving chieftains. So yeah, that's yeah. what it should have been. 
Yeah, <laughs> it should really. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, on, on that tank related bombshell, I am going to open my last beer to raise a glass to Guy and Smith and um, what have I got? Um, I'm kind of slumming it a little bit because it's uh, a brew dog. Oh. Um, but it's a brew dog, one of these brew dog blend things where they've oh. worked with another brewery. And it's layer cake, marshmallow, and chocolate stout. Oops. So give this one a go. I'm opening my last one. Yep. Which is, considering the two previous were pretty strong, hmm. um, I've gone for a, a shandy shack, IPA shandy. Oh, nice. Which is, which is gluten free. Oh. 2.8. Perfect. Mm. Mm. You know what? I do like a nice, refreshing shandy. Yeah. That's, a, that's my daily drink. No, yeah. not, not when I'm working. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, are we going to toast then? Yes, I think we should. To Guy. To, to Guy. guy. Co- yeah. COVID has taken a lot of lives and it's very sad. And yeah. obviously, it's taken a, a very good writer out. So, mm. yeah. It's yeah. good that we've been able to go through some of his work. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, if, if the 27 people who listen to this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> are, are actually um, inclined to try out a bit of Guy and Smith on the back of this, then I think we've done all right. Yeah, but as long as they don't try and buy an Amstrad word processor. Exactly. They need <laughs> no, to, no, they no, need no. To keep the filthy mitts <laughs> off eBay. When does it close, Graham? It's, it's been it's been it's been ongoing for for a long time, actually. <laughs> I keep seeing it and sending it to Andy, going, "Still there?" Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, regularly. <laughs> Just yeah. buy it and get done. Well, yeah. well, we're in the process of moving, so I can't. There's uh, no way I can buy something like that and hide it. But my friend Dave, I spoke to him the other day. He's a collector of all sorts of things, so his partner is very much used to him having things coming into his possession and being distributed around the house. So he <laughs> he he was quite happy for me to use him as a um, a proxy, as it were. <laughs> so th- this gives me the the means. So now I just have to work out whether I can justify the spend on something. <laughs> Which in my mind is, you know, I was talking to him the other day about it, and he was just like, that's not very much money. Well, just, just buy it. Yeah, yeah get it done. Yeah. You only live once. And, and now he's okay to it. There's no excuse now. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Well, we hope that when you buy it, you'll come back on and we can talk about the contents of those floppy disks, yeah. which is probably all readers' letters to men only, circa yeah. 1976. Yeah, or, ju- or just different kinds of wine lists, yeah. wine recipes. Yeah, well, that'd be all right. That'd be worthwhile. Yeah, guys' recipe book. Yeah. <laughs> so, Graham, pleasure to have you on. We've been talking about uh, getting together and doing something for quite a while. And uh, I think this this gives us the appropriate um, energy to push on and do what we've been talking about doing for quite a while, which is yeah. the Black Corridor. Black Corridor, yes. Mm. I need to reread it, though. Yeah, so do I. It's been a while, yeah. Isn't that uh, funny that I'm drinking Black Door tonight? Ah, uh, uh, yes, indeed. So yeah. who wrote the Black Corridor? Moorcock. Ah, I've not yeah. heard of that one. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, a... A 1969 Moorcock sci-fi, which right. uh, has some quite interesting elements to which, it. Which I think it, this is the one that is supposedly the ideas from his wife at the time, isn't it? Right. Oh, Hillary. But, was it was married to Hillary at the time? And Hil- Hillary, who is the friend of my wife's extended family. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's that story I said yeah. uh, about, do you know Michael Moorcock? She's like, oh, I knew him a bit, but next time we meet, I'll tell you the story when I dated Jim, JG Ballard. I was like, "What?" <laughs> so I need wow. to get I need, I need to get this interview from her. You know, yeah. She's in her eighties now. I need to I need to capture this mm. this stuff from her. Yeah, yeah. You know, she lived in um, Labrador Grove around that time. What a scene to yeah. have been a part of. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm really excited for when this this episode comes out. Then. Mm. Mm. Yeah, get those stories for what we do the black corridor. <laughs> well, no, I need to, I need to capture it. She's, she's, she's quite something. Um, yeah, yeah. She, uh, she's called La- La- Laura Mulvey. She came up with the idea of the the, the uh, male gaze. Ah, uh, yeah. 
so that, that was that's uh her thing right which i think we all know about yeah so yeah yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. wow yeah so she's a, a an incredible person to talk to but to the, the fact that she knew hillary and um, you know it's uh quite something mm. fantastic yeah. right well it's been an excellent chin wag crab's moon was a hoop I think I think we will come back to Guy and Smith at some point in the future, but who knows what we'll end up doing for Halloween next year. I think we should I think we should come back to Guy and Smith again. Yeah, I'm sure we will at some point. But again, thanks Graham. Thanks, yes. Phil. And You're uh well, we'll see you next time. Thanks as ever to my co-hosts Phil and, on this occasion, for the first time, Graham. Graham's been working on a lot of music over the last couple of years, in particular an album based upon The Black Corridor, and we will be covering The Black Corridor at some point in the future, but as a teaser for that, we'll play this show out with one of the tracks from The Black Corridor. The collected pulp horror that we mentioned with the interview with Guy and Smith is easily available via certain sites, and is an excellent archive of reviews and interviews on a number of different subjects, some of which quite close to my heart. And there is an excellent article on, for example, The House on the Borderlands by William Hope Hodgson, and also one on The Great White Space by Basil Copper, which was another Pops hand-me-down that I'm very fond of, although I haven't read it for a long time. I really do need to dig it out and give it another look. The Collected Pulp Horror is an excellent read, and it's under a fiver, so well worth picking up. The Authorstroke editors are Justin Marriott and Will Erickson, and they've got a whole host of other stuff available as well, looking at different elements of genre fiction. As mentioned in the intro, Guy's daughter Tara is recharging Guy's social media presence, so the Twitter handle, at Guy and Smith, is now active again, and on Instagram as at Guy underscore N underscore Smith. And there is also a Guy and Smith newsletter, which you can sign up to. And now, as always, it's time to thank our patrons starting with those without tear, and they are Sebastian Weetabix, Tim Cardos, and Sir Anthony Piconti. And our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Ben Fletcher, Dave Washman, Fred Keish, Jim Kirkland, John Lays, John Timothy Watt, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Matt Saltz, Nelbert, Simon Perrins, Tony Malazzo, and our Jugaderos, Alexander Harris, Craig Ledley, Dave Dalrymple, Ian Stead, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Miles Reed Lobato, Open Sussex of course, Steve Round, and Tom Murphy, and to our patron demons, Joe Monty, Andy Clark, Ed Scott, Gareth Wilson, Imria, Paul Hillary, Dread Mortmain, Neil Burton, Norman Beresford, Randall Gatlin, Robert McMillan, and Will Jameson. Thanks all. Your support, as always, is fully appreciated. More so than ever, because we seem to be heading yet again into another rather critical time in this bloody pandemic. What a time to be alive. In just a few short days, we'll be publishing the birthday episode, as is traditional, And this weekend, I'll be away with Phil somewhere, which she doesn't know about yet, so I can't mention it here. But we will be by the sea, and we'll be talking about something, and putting something out in a few days. In the meantime, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruinsoutlook.com. The blog is breakfastintheruins.com, and we have our Patreon page too. But in the meantime, wrap up warm, stay safe. And we'll see you soon on the Moonbeam Rods.
You are in no condition to command this craft. Repeat. You are in no condition to command this craft. Take one dose. ICC Prodital instantly and repeat dose daily. You are endangering the entire expedition.